So I, I understand this is a very mixed audience. Some uh, colleagues from the conference which was mentioned are here. I hope you will not be bored too much. And I hope you can bear with me if I say things in a very simple way. Uh, but I understand there are also many non-physicists here. And for those, I have to apologize if it sounds too complicated for you. <laughs> so we'll see how we go. Uh, on this first picture, you see a telescope. This telescope is not built for astronomy, but it is uh, built for mm -hmm. testing optical communication with satellites. It is called OGS, Optical Ground Station, operated by the European Space Agency, and it stands on the island of Tenerife. I will say more about that a little later. Now, just to set the stage, uh, quantum physics began in 1900. Uh, this is what everybody will tell you. It's not quite correct, by the way. I will say uh, something about that in a second. Uh, in, uh, there, were, there was a, a, a field of study which uh, received a lot of attention in the uh, last 30 years of the 19th century, and that is in a popular way uh, to explain the color of glowing bodies, right? So if you look at a flame, it can be white, red, or yellow, or whatever. The question is not only why does it look like that, but also the spectrum, the distribution of wavelengths to explain that. And it was a problem of which a, 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 a famous German physicist once said, the solution of that problem is so important that it would be it would be worthwhile in order to have enough time to work on the problem to decline the offer of a professorship at the german university why because if you become professor you have to do all kind of other things besides science <laughs> the solution came from from max planck uh, here is the the uh, experiment done by uh, uh, Rubens and Kurlbaum, people at the uh, Physikalisch-Technische Reichsanstalt in Berlin. So here's a little uh, oven made of ceramic. You can heat it, and out of a little hole comes uh, the, the radiation, and you measure the radiation, the spectral distribution of the radiation. And Max Planck was able to explain the spectral distribution by assuming that light is emitted or absorbed by the walls of the, you know, inside this, this body there is radiation, emitted and absorbed in quanta, in indivisible quanta of energy. And he also immediately realized that this is a big problem, conceptual problem, because it's the abandonment, abandonment of continuity in our description of nature. Actually, and this is now for the physicists of you, uh, uh, Max Planck had his famous quantum of action already in 1899. A, pa a paper published on 1st, 1st of July 1899 contains three constants, A, B, and C. C is the speed of light. A and B are what is today called Boltzmann constants and Planck's constant. It's amazing that he had it one year before. It is because uh, he was comparing different expressions of entropy for the radiation system. And actually, also for the physicist, uh, uh, Planck was disappointed initially that the constant which he introduced uh, uh, and which he liked more, which is today called Boltzmann's constant, that it was not named after him. <laughs> okay, things changed after some time. Uh, uh, it, uh, actually, Planck fought for, for uh, at least 16 years against his own idea. In, in 1916, he finally gave up because of the ex excellent agreement with, with uh, new experiments. But I don't want to say much more. Just to again set the stage for our, uh, our friends here, one has to be aware that quantum physics is the basis of modern high technology in many ways. Uh, we could not understand the laser without quantum physics, not semiconductors, not computers, not magnetism. The whole of, of chemistry can be 
explained, and so on and so on. But what I'm talking today about today are still conceptual issues, which are which are debated in quantum physics, and they have been debated from the very beginning on. Uh, one of the big contributors to these conceptual uh, uh, discussions was Albert Einstein, who uh, wrote in 1905, he wrote five papers, uh, which uh, each of them are extremely important. One paper proposes the special theory of relativity, Another paper has, for the first time, uh, the most famous equation in physics, E equals mc squared, the most famous equation. Another one explains Brownian motion. And uh, in, in March, he published a paper where he proposes that light consists of particles. Uh, this, this is the only paper of him which he himself called revolutionary. So it's quite interesting. In a letter to Habicht, he, who was a close friend of him, he, called, he talked about a very revolutionary paper. And actually, as you might know, he got the Nobel Prize for that paper and not for the, for the special theory of relativity. Because at that time, the special theory of relativity was at least for some members of the Nobel Committee, still not completely, you know, founded, not completely safe. And it was actually probably a little problem that the most famous living uh, physicist did not have the Nobel Prize yet. And I understand that Max von Laue, German Nobel Prize winner for, for, uh, for you know, uh, discovering the structure of crystals and the fact that X-rays are waves, proposed him for the, for the photons, for the particles of light, which I think was very, very justified. Uh, here's a quote by Einstein, of which I was not able to find out the year, but I, want, I, I will find it out someday. Uh, the English translation here, uh, I want to spend the rest of my life thinking about the question what light is. And that I uh, took for the title of today's talk. Uh, close to the end of the life, Einstein gave up. He said, all the 50 years of conscious brooding have brought me no closer to answer the question, what are light quant quanta? Of course, today every rascal in German, every, jeder Hinz und Kunz, for the Germans among you, uh, every rascal thinks he knows the answer, but he is deluding himself. And that is actually a very humble statement. And we should always be aware when we think that we understand something, whether we really understand it. Now, to uh, talk about what is the issue, uh, the, the most uh, basic and simple experiment is the two-slit experiment, which was uh, once uh, Richard Feynman uh, 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 said that this uh, experiment contains in it the heart of quantum mechanics, and it contains, he says, the only mystery. I'm not sure if it's the only mystery, but uh, Feynman has the right to say things like that because, after all, he got the Nobel Prize for a very productive formulation of quantum mechanics, so he knew what he was talking about. Uh, this is the famous uh, uh, double slit pattern. I want to talk a little bit about it for a, for a, for a uh, uh, for a short time. So you have, uh, the, this picture is actually, was actually made by Niels Bohr. Niels Bohr was uh, uh, you know, also one of the founders of quantum physics in a sense, because he had explained before the full theory uh, f important features in the structure of atoms with, uh, with the quantum hypothesis. Uh, that picture was done by Niels Bohr, and, and you, as you might know, Niels Bohr was a theoretical physicist. But he knew what is important in an experiment. You see? <laughs> the screws are important. No, today, not even experimentalists throw the screws anymore. But the screws are important, because otherwise the experiment would fall apart, right? <laughs> so it's very irrelevant. So, 
so the, the, uh, it, uh, you see here Niels Bohr and Albert Einstein, who had a very intensive dialogue from 1927 on, on the meaning of quantum physics, uh, which was based on Gedanken experiments, on thought experiments. And this is one such thought experiment. What is the issue? It's very simple. Uh, you have some, sorry, you have some light coming from left here, going through this first slit, and then you have here two slits open. And here you have an observation screen. So when both slits are open under the right condition, you get bright and dark fringes on these br bright and dark stripes uh, on, these, uh, on that observation screen. Why? Because there are two waves going through the two slits. One wave goes through here, one wave goes through here. The both waves come here. And at some, at some places here, the two waves uh, are in sync, so they enforce each other. At some other places, they are completely opposite, and they destroy each other. So far, easy. That experiment was a classic in physics. Uh, it was uh, uh, done, supposedly done by Thomas Young in 1802 or 1803. I say supposedly because there is still a discussion among historians whether he really did it, or whether he just described uh, the, the phenomenon. <laughs> It's the same discussion as with, uh, with, with Galilei with this leaning tower, whether he really threw balls from the leaning tower or not. Anyway, now the problem comes when, with Einstein when he says, wait a minute, light consists of particles. And if I take the particles seriously, they can only go through one of the two slits. Clearly, the particle of light comes from here, it goes either through here or either through here. Okay, so far, fine. Okay, then the question is how do I explain the interference fringes here? How do I explain the stripes with particles? Now Einstein actually said, and this can be, can be shown, it starts in 1909 in, a, in, a, in, a, in, in, in Salzburg, that he actually realized already in 1905 in the paper where he proposes particles of light that this is a problem. And Einstein was a realist. He believed that, that the particles really follow path. And therefore, in order to explain that if the stripes uh, exist uh, for particles, he assumed that there are many particles going through here and many going through here. They meet here. They have the information that both slits are open, in a sense, and they arrange themselves to get the stripes, which is a reasonable position. Okay? The problem now is, uh, what will happen if you send in these particles one by one, one after the other? And here Einstein was wrong. He expected that this will not show interference. You can do the experiment today. I mean, it's, it's standard in many laboratories. Uh, uh, 30 years ago, this was still a big thing to do it with individual photons. You can do it now. It's standard to have a, a camera here and send, send uh, one in one experiment. For example, a student of mine, Birgit Dopfer, did. She had actually one photon every minute, one particle every minute. So it's one coming through. It's registered by the camera somewhere and then nothing. And then a minute later, another one comes, and then nothing. So it's really one by one. And if you have many going through, you can see the interference stripes. And if you close one of the two slits, you get no interference stripes. So somehow, in, the, in Einstein's picture, somehow, the particle going through here knows whether the other slit is open or not. And in such a picture, this is just magic. How would you explain it? Right? It is just magic. Okay? The modern way in quantum mechanics is, and this is now an important message to take home, you are not allowed to talk about properties of a system, about features, unless you really do the experiment which allows you to find out what the feature is. So in other words, you are not allowed to talk about the path taken by the particle, unless you really do an experiment which allows you to determine the path. 
Okay. So, and this, so, uh, and, or, or in an even more modern way to talk about it is to say that interference only arises if there is no, if and only if there is no path information anywhere in the universe. So neither the particle knows where it goes through, nor uh, somebody, uh, they know, uh, so, so uh, information means that, it means the possibility to find out which path it took. Okay, so that possibility uh, must not exist and then you get interference. Okay, so there is some objective, objective ignorance, objective non-existence of a property. So it, it is not our not knowing, but the mere idea to assume that the particle goes through here or here, but we just don't know which one it is, is wrong. Equally well, I would submit uh, the following words I, would, I also personally don't like. Some people say that the particle goes through both slits. Well, what's the meaning of such a statement? I don't like it either. It, it is really complete ignorance about, about the situation. Okay? So, if we go on now, I show you one experimental result done many years ago in the same a series of experiments where we tested uh, uh, Professor bielinski Biola's uh, uh, nice, really nice theory. I liked it. It would have been nicer if it worked, but it didn't work. Uh, uh, <laughs> so that's the way it is. This is the two-slit experiment with neutrons. Rather heavy for us, neutrons are heavy particles. They're very massive particles. We are made mostly of neutrons. Our body consists, or maybe protons. I actually don't know what do we have more, Proton, protons or neutrons. We have to, no, it must be neutrons. It must be neutrons. Ah, maybe not, maybe protons. <laughs> we, have to, <laughs> we have to figure it out, okay. Anyway, so neutrons are other heavy particles, and we did an experiment at, at the nuclear reactor in Grenoble where we have a two-slit assembly just as you, as you have it before, and the neutrons are really going on, so one by one. The intensity was so low that when one particle was going through, the next particle, which will go through, was still sitting in its uranium nucleus. You know, the neutrons are produced by fission of uranium. was still sitting in the uranium neutron, uh, nucleus and not knowing that it will be emitted soon because this is objective ignorance, right? <laughs> so this is really one by one. And the important point here about this pattern is is that the solid line which you see is direct calculations with no free parameter except the total intensity. And that kind of agreement allows to test alternatives to quantum mechanics. So as always, and I showed you the experiment with, uh, with, with, with uh, neutrons, as always uh, our colleagues in, in the, uh, on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean are far ahead of us. Here's a proof of that. That is a sign on a parking lot in Washington, D.C. And it obviously they have quantum cars, which can use somehow both exits at the same time. And the proof also is that you cannot see the quantum cars here, because if you would observe them, you would destroy the interference pattern. So, so this kind of thing of, 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 of uh, which we saw now is, is the, the, the catch word is superposition. So the system is in a superposition of two possibilities, namely the possibility of going through this slit and through this slit. It's a very strange, very abstract notion. A superposition of two possibilities. Okay? The next point, there are three notions which I would like uh, uh, you to carry home. The next notion I would like you to carry home is the role of randomness in quantum mechanics. Uh, already Einstein in 1909, and this is quite remarkable because you have to imagine that in 1909 quantum theory did not exist yet. There were very few papers. But Einstein had, or, there were, was, the, was the Planck paper and, the, and Einstein's own paper of 1905, and, and both ideas were not really accepted by the scientific community yet. 
Einstein realized in 1909 at a meeting in Salzburg that, that randomness or chance, Zufall in German, plays a qualitatively new role in the quantum world. A qualitatively new role. Uh, the point is that if uh, in, in classical physics or everyday physics, everyday life, when something happens randomly, when you say you meet somebody uh, by chance or something, there's always the possibility of finding an explanation why this event happens. And I would say that in daily life, we do not give up until we find an explanation. We are not happy by having, by, we are not happy by saying this just happened. There's no explanation possible. There's no explanation possible even. That's the point. There's always an explanation possible. In the quantum world, as Einstein realized, uh, randomness or chance plays a new role, namely that there are individual events for which there is no cause. There is no causal explanation. We can explain that this, the, the, the behavior of large numbers of systems very, very well, but, but not individual systems anymore. And Einstein uh, uh, one, uh, wrote a famous sentence in 1926 uh, to, to Max Born. He said, in any case, I'm convinced that the old guy does not play dice with the universe. You know, play dice, just this is a die here. Play dice with the universe. Which is often quoted as, God does not play dice. To which, and I like to say, when I will say, have discussions sometimes with with uh, theologians and so on. And I tell them the quant individual quantum event is so random that not even God does, knows what will come out. And then sometimes, sometimes they are upset, but less and less, they get more flexible now. Uh, <laughs> but sometimes they are upset. And I tell them, what gives you the right to limit the powers of God? Maybe he wanted to create the universe in such a way that things happen which even surprise him, you know? Or her, whatever you want. <laughs> anyway, so the answer uh, which supposedly Niels Bohr gave him, but it is said, it is one of the legends. I'm not sure whether, whether it can be proven. The, uh, the answer which Niels Bohr gave him is perfect. It is, stop telling God how to run the universe. <laughs> That's actually... Niels Bohr told that this is a perfect answer to, to tell. But I would say that Einstein is the only person who, would have, who has the right to tell God how to run the universe because he really knew what was going on. So anyway, uh, now uh, uh, one other message of my talk today is uh, so far you might say what I'm talking about is all very philosophical and so on and so on. But uh, the interesting development in science always is that the always i would say that there's no exception if somebody follows something out of curiosity in a very deep way you discover new things of which in the beginning you don't know what they are good for but in the end they can be turned into something and this is also the case for randomness for example this is an application of of, of quantum randomness which is techno technologically used you have, a, you have a light source, a laser, uh, uh, and you have a 50-50 beam splitter. This is uh, just imagine a bad mirror, a bad mirror which reflects half of the light and the half of goes through. See, even if when you stand in front of a, of, a, of a shop, you sometimes see yourself and this thing inside the shop, right? And uh, so this is easy to understood on the wave picture for particles is difficult. Because why, why does an individual particle decide whether it goes this way or this way? And again, this is complete randomness. Actually, the particle, individual particle exists in the superposition of both possibilities until it is measured. And when you measure it here, the particle immediately knows that it should not be measured here anymore, even as it existed in the superposition of both possibilities before. This is called the collapse of the wave function, which is a problem for some people. For some people it is not, which is a good sign, because when people disagree about something, it might be a source for productivity. <laughs> and I, I, say this now, I say this now because 
because what you see here is a sequence of random numbers created by such, by, by, by that phenomenon, and uh, that can be used technologically. And I understand that there are even such random number generators, as they are called, based on this kind of phenomenon used in, now, in some casinos now. It's quite interesting. So we have some possible applications. I keep I skip showing this cat. It would take too long, but I can. Add. No, I was expecting that you say no. <laughs> I was expecting that you say no. Uh, it, we have the year 1935, and uh, uh, Erwin Schrödinger, Austrian physicist, who developed what is called wave mechanics. It's one of the formulations of the theory, uh, wrote a paper with the title uh, Zur gegenwärtigen Situation in der Quantum Mechanics. It's translated on the present situation in quantum mechanics. And it uses nearly no equations. And I would say it can be read even by non-specialists. You find it on the internet in the English, in an English translation. And, and, and Schrodinger uh, there worries about the question whether these phenomena we talked about, like for example the phenomenon of superposition, would only be valid for small systems or also for big systems. And is there a limit somewhere? And to show how, how as he said, bizarre, he, use, he really uses the word bizarre, how bizarre it would be if quantum mechanics would be true for big systems, he invented a, a, a thought experiment. He puts a cat here in a box together with what he called a Hölln machine, a devil's uh, machine. And uh, the, the machine consists, sorry, the machine consists of a radioactive atom which sits here with a detector which uh, detects whether the atom has decayed or not. And uh, when the atom decays, it releases a hammer which breaks a small glass here containing cyanic acid. And in the container, there's also the cat. It is clear if the container breaks, the poor cat dies. Okay? Now, quantum mechanics, so, so far it's not very interesting, but quantum physics says that after some time, we cannot talk about, we cannot say that the that the atom is decayed or not decayed. We have to say that the atom is in a superposition of decayed and not decayed. It's both at the same, at the same time, so to speak. A superposition of both possibilities. Therefore, the hammer is fallen down and not fallen down. The, the glass is broken or not, and the cat is in a superposition of life and death. And that is obviously absurd. That's nonsense. How can we talk it that way? Now, one can, one can look, like one can see this as a challenge also, which is actually a challenge which is taken up by many groups now in the world for how large objects can we show these quantum phenomena. Is there a limit? This is interesting in its own right, and it might also be interesting for developing new technology. And this is a very, very very, very classical, uh, very, very active uh, uh, program. The question you might also ask is, when the system is in a superposition, why do we see a classical world? Why do we see the cat alive or dead? My answer is that the quant, it's not every physicist's answer. I'm sure that there are people in the audience, who, physicists, who do, do not agree with my position. My position is that the quantum state, which is what we talk about, superposition of the possibilities, only describes uh, uh, the, uh, pro uh, only uh, information about possible measurement results, and no more. It is not a statement about the real factual situation out there. And if you have that assumption, nothing can happen. But you give up uh, something about direct connection to reality. I will say more in a minute, because I come now to the third notion which I would like you to carry home. The first notion was superposition, the second one was randomness, and the third one is entanglement. It goes back to this paper published in 1935 by Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen in Princeton. 
Einstein was in Princeton because when uh, the Nazis came to power in Germany, he happened to be uh, uh, outside. Uh, I think he was in Belgium or something like that. And he decided never to go back to Germany any, uh, anymore, and he got the position in Princeton. He collaborated, collaborated there with Podolsky and Rosen. That paper, which is very famous, I will tell you in a second how famous it is, uh, was actually published by Physical Review without ever having been seen by a referee. They just accepted it. As soon as Einstein, as soon as they sent his papers to referees, Einstein did not send them paper anymore. Because he told them, you, told not, you did not ask my permission that you sent my paper to somebody else. <laughs> he's, a good, he's a good physician, I think. Now, the point simply is, is that uh, in the idea, I do not want to go into the logic of the paper, which is very complicated, actually. Uh, the, uh, uh, they put forward the idea that you might have two systems, two particles, which have interacted at some time, in some way, and uh, uh, they are separated. You can look, see them as billiard balls, if you want, even. And if in quantum mechanics, uh, the point is that the two are connected, that this, the notion is entanglement in a way that, in a way that a measurement of one gives some random result. I will say more about it in a second, and that that immediately collapses, as we say, the quantum state of the other one in a well-defined state, it was undefined before, well-defined state depending on the measurement here. Einstein did not like it, and he called it spooky action at a distance. Uh, before we go into more detail, here is what New York Times wrote. It wrote, uh, uh, Einstein attacks quantum theory, scientists and two colleagues find it not complete, even though correct. The other two were also scientists. <laughs> But if you publish with Einstein, I think you have no chance to be called a scientist, you know? It's, that's just the way it is. <laughs> anyway, here is something interesting which tells you uh, the development of our field here, of my, of my own field and so on. It is the citations which this paper uh, receives over the years. Citation simply means that when you write the, I, I explain for the non-scientists, non when you write some scientific uh, uh, paper, you have to quote the papers which are important for you. Uh, uh, partly because you have to quote whenever you use something, otherwise you would be, you would be accused of, of stealing ideas. And on the other hand, it is sometimes nice to kind of put more, more, power, more weight into your paper if you quote famous people, you know, that can help. Anyway, these are the citations of the einstein potosky rosen paper. The paper came out in 1935. Uh, 1935. There were uh, only, as far as I know, five citations in the beginning. And not at, at, otherwise, nothing happened. The citations were not bad, because one was by Niels Bohr, two were by, by, by uh, Schrödinger, for example. And then nothing happened. So that paper would not have gotten Einstein a permanent position. <laughs> right? It was nothing. Some people here today would say that it was justified, but never mind. Uh, then you see that, the f that it starts again in the 1970s, 1980s. Because it turned out, uh, due to uh, uh, a, a be Irish physicist John Bell, that the philosophical position in the einstein podolsky rosen paper is in conflict with some predictions of quantum mechanics. And when that happens, it's the perfect situation because you can do an experiment. You can test who is right. And then you see around 2000, we again have a huge increase. And that was when people discovered that entanglement has an important role to play in new ideas about, uh, about uh, computing. We talk about the quantum computer. We talk about quantum cryptography, we talk about quantum communication, we talk about quantum teleportation and so on. And today the paper is typically quoted, as you see, once every day. Which I would submit does not mean that it is read more often than in the old days. 
but that is a different story. Here is the original quote about Einstein with the spooky action, a letter to Max Born in December 1947. Uh, the reason I cannot really believe in it, namely quantum theory, is because the theory cannot be reconciled with the principle that physics has to describe a reality in space and time without spooky action at a distance. Okay. So we can uh, go on. I skip the next picture. We go here now. Uh, this one here. No, this one is easy. Yeah. Uh, this is just, just what I said before, the, explana uh, the visualization of entanglement, two particles which interact and then they are separated and we call it spook. Uh, Schrödinger, in the same uh, paper where he proposed the Schrödinger cut paradox, analyzes uh, entanglement and he called, he invented the German name Verschränkung, which is actually a much better name than, than entanglement. Verschränkung means something like that. You know, a really connection, mutual strong connection in a sense. Entanglement is like spaghetti and I understand that Polish name is also like spaghetti which is not such a good idea. Spaghetti is, is more disordered, but, but that's the way it is. And Schrödinger realizes there already, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, expressed in the modern language, that you have uh, two systems here symbolized by the two dice, uh, which are connected in the following way. The result for each one is completely random. I show a six here is completely random, random in the quantum sense that there is no cause, there's no causal explanation why you get in a specific run of the experiment the six. If these were entangled quantum dice, which do not exist yet, but I promise they will be under the Christmas tree in the year, in the year 2100. You can come back to me if this is not true, okay? <laughs> so. <laughs> so, because if of this development for having quantum effects for larger and larger systems. Anyway, so we have complete randomness here. But, but that result is random, but it, if we now, but the other, the other, the, the measurement on the other system will give the same result. And this is also random. And how can it be that two completely random events show the same results? Mathematically, we can describe perfectly what goes on. Schrödinger says that this is really a break with the classical picture. Classical is the pre-quantum classical picture of the world. He says in classical physics, and that is true, we can only have correlations between systems if we have correlata, if, if we have, the, if the features themselves are well defined, like an example, identical twins. If you have identical twins, they, they have the same features because they carry the same genes. They have features which explain it. Now, in the quantum case, they are identical, but there are no features which define it. And Schrodinger says somewhere that this means that we have to say farewell to our cherished views how the world works. So in a modern way, uh, uh, Abner Shimoni, a physicist and philosopher in, in Boston, once said that this kind of situation, in his opinion, uh, means that we have to abandon either our ideas about space and time or our ideas about reality. Or maybe the world is even more romantic and we have to abandon both of them. That's my opinion. <laughs> now here's a small advertisement for, for a small advertisement to come to Tirol, Austria, not far from Innsbruck. That is the grave of Erwin Schrödinger. He was buried there. And the equation here is his equation, which I think is probably the technologically most important equation ever invented by anyone. I mentioned it in the beginning. And uh, the equation actually on that, the, which you see there, was written by a grandson of Schrödinger, Terry Rudolf, who is a colleague of us in our field. He is professor at Imperial College in London. So now we should, if you, if you want to understand in a non-mathematical way of what goes on, I suggest to read a paper which is available on the internet. It's called Bertelmann's Socks and the Nature of Reality. 
It was written by John Bell. It's about Mr. Bertelmann, who is a colleague of mine in Vienna. And Mr. Bertelmann, at, at some time when he became around 18, he decided to always wear socks of different color for the rest of his life. Okay? Now he has to do it because there's no choice anymore. So when you see Bertelmann coming around the corner and you see one sock pink, and you definitely know the other sock is not pink. Which is, which is easy and it's not surprising. It's a, it's a silly, trivial uh, uh, thing. Now, the article is about if these were quantum socks, it would be wrong to assume that the socks have the colors before the first observation, before you look at them. Now, I mentioned John Bell already, who an uh, Irish physicist who in 1964 found out that uh, the predictions of quantum physics and the ideas of the einstein podolsky rosen paper are in conflict for some experiments. Uh, let me just explain what the position of the einstein podolsky rosen paper is. Once more, it's called local realism. means that local means there's no spooky action at a distance. Realism means that the experiment reveals a property of the system which exists prior to and independent of observation. So the combination of the two uh, is in, uh, leads to the, is, is the basis of the einstein podolsky rosen thinking. And he showed uh, uh, for, for that basically, uh, if you do for a certain class of measurements on entangled systems, uh, 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 you get the conflict between the two ideas. The system is very simple, and this is the, the system which is most frequently used in experiment now, is two polarized photons, <coughs> particles of light, polarization, horizontal, vertical, you know, light, polarization of light, uh, and you do polarization measurements, and whenever you measure both, you find them both, either both be horizontal or both vertical. A simple assumption would be that the source produces half of them polarized this way, the other half this way. That is wrong. The source produces them in a state where the two have to be identical when you measure them in the same way, but they don't carry the polarization before you measure them. Just like Schrodinger's dice before. You measure one, you get a random result, and the other one is projected into the corresponding state. Mm -hmm. Then what happens if the two polarizers are rotated a little bit to each other? Then you don't get perfect correlations anymore. It can happen sometimes that for the vertical photon here, you get horizontal here. And it turns out that in quantum mechanics, the correlations are stronger than in any local realistic uh, 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 picture. And that can be tested in experiment. Okay. So there are many experiments over, the, over time. Uh, it is impossible for me to do to, to justice to that. I just want to uh, mention a few things. One is an experiment which, uh, the series of experiments which we do on the Canary Islands of Tenerife. We curate, curate our photons, uh, 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 on, we create the photons on La Palma. We send one photon over to Tenerife and the other photon is measured on La Palma. We actually can delay this photon in glass fibers, so we measure this one at the time when the other photon is already on its way, and lo and behold, we get the correlations predicted by quantum mechanics. Here are some, for your relaxation, here are some, some pictures of the situation. Uh, we are off the east coast, uh, the west coast of Africa here, here is the receiving telescope. Again, the receiving telescope. This is a very. Uh, this is the sending place to the left. Our sending telescope. Uh, the distance is about 150 kilometers. Uh, this is a very nice picture. I like it because it really is romantic. Uh, but for the physicist, this is a bad picture actually. <laughs> but it is taken from this big mountain you saw behind the telescope before. It's called El Teide, the highest mountain of Spain. This is Spanish. And uh, the picture, I got, it, I got it from the internet. The picture is taken from the top of El Teide, just before sunset. And you look in the opposite direction, you see the full moon. 
And you also, what you see here is the shadow of the mountain where you are. It's the shadow of the mountain on what? And that's the bad news for physics. It's the shadow on dust which came from the Sahara Desert. So the reddish, yellowish thing is dust in the air, which actually makes the experiment not possible. And that happens in summer specifically very often. So this is a big challenge for our experiment. But I like the pictures. It's really romantic in a sense. Now let me come to teleportation because I promised that in the title and I was asked to <laughs> include it also. Uh, when we go to s teleportation was, uh, was invented in, in, in science fiction, as you know. And you know why it was invented in, the, in these movies? Like always, money is the driving force. It was invented to save production costs for the movie. Because it would, be, it would cost a lot when a spaceship arrives at a new planet to show how it lands on that planet and then it takes off again. But when you beam people up and down, that's much simpler. <laughs> it, it, costs less, it costs less money. And the, the idea there, and now I'm serious again, the idea there is that you have an original object, you scan the information which the object carries, you transfer the information to the receiving station and you reconstitute the object based on that information, which is not a bad idea in principle. Now, the problem is that somebody told these guys it doesn't work because of Heisen, so-called Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, which means that you cannot find out the quantum state of an individual system unless you know already what the state is. So, so uh, the measurement would actually change the quantum state, destroy it. And uh, uh, there's a famous story that uh, Gene Roddenberry, one of the people on the, on the movie set, uh, was once asked at the press conference, how does the Heisenberg compensator work? And he gave the best possible answer. He said, very well, thank you. The Heisenberg com compensator was invented to compensate for that problem. Now, as always, we know from medicine, as always, the cure comes from the, from, the, from the problem, comes from the disease. Quantum teleportation works in the following way. You want to teleport this incoming state over to some receiver from Alice to Bob. And what you do is you use, in addition, an entangled pair. And to express it in simple words, uh, the trick is that somehow you, you entangle, you entangle now, entanglement means in one version, that's the one we are talking about now, is that the two systems are equal, but, but it is not defined uh, what their properties are, right? So if we have polarization, same polarization, but it's not defined what the polarization is. And you now entangle the original, which is in some state which we don't know, some arbitrary, if it's photons, some arbitrary polarization, you entangle these two guys with each other, and that way, that way the information is transferred because of the entanglement over to the other side. There are some additional tricks to be played, uh, uh, I, which I don't want to, to, to mention here. Uh, the important in, in, interesting point actually here is that uh, the information, it circumvents the Heisenberg verdict because the information which the original carries is not determined by a measurement, it is just transferred from A to B without it being measured, without it being, being noticed. The idea is by, by a group of, of six colleagues, Bennett, Brazard, Crepeau, Perez, Chosa, and Wouters, and there have been many experiments since, since then about this kind of situation. I should say right away this has nothing to do with space travel in the future. This is still just science fiction. But entanglement is, con but this kind of procedure is, co is considered to maybe important someday to transfer information from one quantum computer to another one. Here is just two examples of recent experiments. Uh, experiment done by us on the Canary Islands over 143 kilometers, and an experiment done in China, the group of Chi and Wei Pan, about 97 kilometers. We had a nice competition here. The Chinese were finished a little bit before us, which was good, 
because they cover the shorter distance, we cover the longer distance, so each one was happy. You know, if it would have been the other way around, it would not be so good. So <laughs> it is much better that way. And we have a good, we have a collaboration now with China, where we where we want to to uh, establish worldwide quantum communication from satellites uh, uh, to put a uh, source of entangled particles up on a satellite, and the plan is to be to be up there. Uh, uh, in 1916, that will be quite quite interesting. Now I come to the very last part of my talk. Some recent because I want to show you a movie if it works on this computer, which I don't know yet. Uh, a recent, a rather recent uh, 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 experiment. Uh, the question: you, you can now use the photons, the particles of light, to carry information. Like you can use polarization, horizontal, vertical. That means that you can use a photon to carry one bit of information, zero or one. Now the question is, can the photon carry more information, or is that a limit? And the answer is, it is not a limit. And that is a recent development, which was uh, uh, actually started in the 1990s by, by the lower paper here, which I mentioned here, uh, the group of Werdmann. It turned out that in, in addition of po having polarization, the photon can have a wave, a wave front, which is not pl plane waves, but it is screws, screw type wave front. And that cr screw type wave front can have, uh, you know, you can have cr cr screws with very different pitch. And it turns out that in principle, that allows a, an infinite number of of possible different informations carried by an individual photon. Uh, I want to mention an experiment which we did about that, about free space communication. Uh, there, it is always nice when you find a prediction, as Professor Bielinitsky Birula told us before, when an experimentalist finds a prediction which you can test or when you can do something about it. There are scores of paper which say that these screw types, type waves cannot be used for free space communication because the atmosphere, the fluctuations of atmosphere would destroy it much too fast. And they all come to a limit of about one kilometer. This is it's at least a dozen papers. It's quite interesting. And the point is the papers are all correct. But we found a way around. <laughs> okay? The point simply is the following. Uh, so we so we have uh, I, I will now show you a movie about some experiment over a distance of one, one uh, about three kilometers uh, between uh, two different locations in Vienna. This is the sending station, uh, a laser from the sending station, receiving station. And the basic idea simply is, I say it before we see the movie, is that instead of sending these, these states themselves, these screw type states, you send superpositions of the two. And the superpositions are much more stable against disturbance because they see the same fluctuations in a sense, in a simple way. Now, what we did in the experiment, we showed, we, we, we sent uh, pictures, typically Austrian pictures here, Mozart sent and received, Boltzmann sent and received, Schrödinger sent and received, and my colleagues could not resist, my young colleagues could not resist the following temptation. Uh, this is the temptation here. Uh, the link here goes acro actually across the embassy of the United States of America. <laughs> okay? Just across, harmless, no problem. But my young students decided to send the following picture also across that link. <laughs> this is <laughs> this is not published yet. I just I just show it exclusively to you. Now I have a movie, but I want to show the movie in the end because if it doesn't work, I, I might I might bring the computer into all kinds of problems. I conclude with a few remarks. That would have been the movie. A few remarks. This is I told you in the beginning. Einstein's idea, 1905 which was not accepted for a long time. And it was not even accepted in 1913. 
And in the end, he got the Nobel Prize, 1921, for that. It's quite interesting. 1913, this is a letter. Einstein was proposed for membership in the Prussian Academy of Sciences in Berlin. And th that membership meant that he gets a nice salary, which the first pa paragraph says, and he was free to do whatever research he wants to do. And then the letter says, uh, the fact that, in, this is the lower partner, the fact that in his, po, uh, in his speculations he occasionally, uh, 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 occasionally went too far, for example, in his hypothesis of quanta of light should not be weighed too heavily against him, because without taking risks, uh, you cannot even in the exact sciences introduce something new. So they realized that the idea was new and they did not accept it. And the signatures are Planck, the father of the quantum hypothesis. Uh, uh, Nernst, you know, he was a famous chemist with uh, uh, some, okay. Ruben and Rubens. Rubens was the guy who had done the black body radiation experiment which led Planck to the quantum hypothesis. Isn't that fascinating that even 1913, uh, uh, 13 years later, they did not realize how important this was. Now, let me conclude. This is a, this is an, an, a, if a nice statement. In 1985, there was a conference celebrating the centennial of Niels Bohr's in Cambridge, Massachusetts. I was there as a young guy. I was not one of the big invited people. And, and, uh, and there was, uh, uh, was Rabi, I, I, Rabi, the, uh, the discoverer what, of, nuclear magnetic resonance, which you always, which you all know because when you get an NMR uh, scan in the hospital, uh, his ideas are used. And, uh, and Rabi said, I think we are missing a very basic point, namely in quantum mechanics, in the interpretation, not in, not in the, the theory. The theory is fantastic and perfectly correct. I think we are missing a very basic point. The next generation, when they found it, will knock on their heads and say, how how could they, or oh, it should be they, how could they have missed that? And I hope he's right, and I hope I'm still alive when somebody finds it. <laughs> okay. Now, I conclude with a remark which is important, and it, it's a remark, important remark for all politicians. There was Michael Faraday, uh, for the non-physicist, he is the, 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 the guy who discovered many laws which are important for generation for e electricity and for turning electricity into mechanical uh, energy and vice versa and so on. Uh, uh, Michael Faraday must have been famous already because he was invited, uh, or, or, or because he was, he, you know, he, he, he was visited by a person called Sir Gladstone. He was the chancellor of the exchequer. That means the finance minister. Okay? And he, and the chancellor, the finance minister made a mistake to ask Faraday, that is all very nice, but what should it be good for? <laughs> and this is a mistake because Faraday's answer was extremely elegant. One day, your honor, you will tax it. <laughs> <laughs> It is absolutely correct. If, if you don't know how it is in Poland, but in Austria, when you get your electricity bill, it has tax on it. So, it's, so it was absolutely correct. So I'm at the end of my talk. I, I want to thank you for your attention. This is a picture of my group on the roof of our institute in Vienna. And you see two of these people actually here in the audience. Uh, you see one of our telescopes, and you also see another point, namely, I am by far the oldest guy in the picture, and this is actually part of the fun of, of being a scientist, that you can work with young people all the time. And now I want to see if I can start, oh, how can I, wait a minute, can somebody of the technicians help me? How can I get this, this down? Is, is some can uh, I cannot I, I'm not used to the to this version of window. I would like to I would like to start the movie now. Can you get this? Yes. Can we turn the sound a little up?
So this is the alphabet used in our communication experiment with these screw type states. So that is how the different states are made by reflection at what is called a spatial light modulator. We look at it with the CCD camera and then we have a neural network in the computer which identifies which letter of the alphabet it is. And these are the different information sent. These are the superpositions. scan across and you see different pattern from each pixel a different pattern <laughs> and I should also mention this was a classical experiment Mario Crane is the is the main uh, uh, person and the others are collaborators. One of them is here, Mehul. And I should mention this was the classical experiment, but recently we were also able to do the same with entangled states in these higher dimensions.